Dearly beloved in Christ, with tonight's feast, the Christmas season is completed, not in the simple sense of finishing it, but in the fuller sense of perfecting it. For the past 40 days, we have heard many scriptural and liturgical references to light, and tonight the light of the world comes into his temple. At Christmas Matins, Isaiah told us that the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. To them that dwelled in the region of the shadow of death, light has arisen. On Christmas Day, St. John spoke to us from his lofty place. In him was life, he said, and light, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. <clears throat> The Magi followed the light of a star to find the light of the world and adored him when they found him. And the baptism of the Lord is traditionally called the festival of light because as St. Gregory says, his baptism affects our purification and strengthens the light we received from him in the beginning, which we darkened and blotted out through our sin. In other words, light is a theme of the Christmas season and this because of the time of year for it is when the sunlight is weakest that the Son of God came forth as light from his mother's womb. And by doing so, as Gregory says, he strengthens our light, the light of grace and truth. With Easter, we celebrate our Lord's triumph over sin and death and the promise of eternal life. But with Christmas, we rejoice more in the illumination of our minds and the warmth of grace that opens our hearts. Today's Feast of the Purification puts the cap on the theme of light through the liturgical customs which have grown in response to Simeon's words, that our Lord is lumen ad revelation and gentium, a light for the revelation of the nations. Candles are blessed and lit to signify the light which Christ gives to us through his incarnation. The candle represents his humanity and the flame his divinity. We can hold the candle, but we cannot hold the flame. But the flame becomes accessible to us and enlightens our eyes because of the candle. There is a certain darkness to the candle because it is material. If there were only the candle and no flame, we could not see by it. But because we are like owls which see light only when night is fallen, we see the flame best by means of the candle. Divinity is known to us through the humanity of Christ. This light that is Christ shines in the darkness, as St. John says, and the darkness does not overcome it. Whether the darkness be the demons who seek our ruin and who resent the kingship of Christ, or whether the darkness be the error and ignorance of so many men who oppose our Lord in his sweet yoke, or whether the darkness be in our own souls, weighed down as we are by despair or depression. There is no darkness powerful enough to encompass this divine light. Our Lord will always be the light of nations. As Malachi says, the sun of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. St. Thomas says, in spite of the number of men who have struggled against Christ, being as they are obscured by sin, blinded by envy, and darkened by pride, they do not overcome the light. He says they never gain the victory of so obscuring him that his brightness does not shine throughout the whole world. So what is our role in all of this? It is to hold our candles well, to feed the flame, to let the wax burn if necessary onto our hands to offer our bodies as a shield so that the light will continue to shine in this world. Since the Lord came into this world, there was, through the power of his incarnation, an ever-growing light, shining brightest in the Father's, and brought to a perfect synthesis by Damascene and Aquinas. But with nominalism and all the false schools of thought and practice that arose from that, the light began to wane in this world. And today the light is such that it seems that it is late November and the world is near its end. But still even now the light shines in the darkness. 
Our role is to offer our lives and carry our crosses so that the flame always has a candle by which it can burn. To make this a little bit clearer, consider the witness of my patron, St. Alban, the proto-martyr of England. He was a simple layman. Later legends call him a soldier, but whatever his actu actual occupation was, he was simply a commoner. When a persecution broke out, he protected a priest in his house. When they came for the priest, he exchanged clothes with him and died in his place. The priest escaped to go on baptism, baptizing and forgiving sins and offering Christ's sacrifice. By Alban's virtuous deed, the light continued to shine in England. Our role in the mess that is modernity is the same as Alban's. We are protect, to protect the flame, to pass it on, to allow it to enlighten others, to do whatever it takes, however modestly that we do it, so that the flame will live to see the next day. And if someone comes to put it out, we are to protect it even unto death, so that darkness will never prevail in this world. St. Alban's life was short. It was probably about 30 years. His life as a Christian was very short because he was baptized while he was harboring the priest. And yet his action in the time of crisis led to the birth of Christianity in England, such that until it was blotted out by very unholy men, it too was a light to the nations and to all of Europe. So as you hold your candles again this evening, at the time of the consecration, think of them as symbols as your responsibility to let the light shine in the darkness. Hold them carefully, admire their, their flame, which represents Christ, and read by their light. And above all, guard the flame. The Lord does not ask us to do impossible things right now, such as reform the church all by ourselves, or convert this nation all by ourselves. He asks us to do things that are well within our grasp, to love his incarnation, to study the truths of our faith, to open ourselves more and more to grace, and to help others to do these things, especially our children. For each of us, it takes on a different appearance, but the essence is the same. To guard the flame of faith that the Lord has enkindled by his passion. Because he came as a light into this world as his conception, it is true. But his light burned most brightly when he offered himself on the cross in reparation for our sins. And what we have learned through this past year is if we are to guard the flame, we must also guard the candle. It says in the book of Proverbs that the Son of God delights to be with the children of men. He loves the human race. He loves us as his creation, and he loves us as the price of his precious blood. He is, as the Byzantine liturgy says, the lover of mankind. The crises of the past year have made it such that human nature is constantly thwarted. There are to be no more handshakes, they say, no more family meals, no more public worship, and certainly no more sacraments. But the flame dwells among us because of the candle. If we are to pass on the faith and guard it ourselves, we must love human nature. We must defend the beauty and the necessity of our senses, of conversation with one another, of hugs and handshakes, of writing letters, of singing together, and of speaking face to face. Not over some medium, but face to face. The time has come now when to guard the flame, which is Christ, it is necessary to first acknowledge the candle as something more than a mere instrument which we can dispose when we wish. But the candle is something that is elevated by the Son of God and will thus forever be good and honorable. Because of our Lord, because of his incarnation, and especially because of his passion, 
The candle is holy, our human nature is holy, and the flame is holy. The flame is holy by its very being because it is divine. The candle has been made holy through the flame of becoming man. These are the truths that we must live and die for. But we should have courage because the Lord says, in the world you shall have distress, and we certainly do. But have confidence, I have overcome the world. In this time of trial, but also this time of promise, because it is truly a time of promise, may the sweet Mother of God, whose feast this is, intercede for us. As she defended the fragility of Christ in his infancy and his childhood when he was but a small flame, may she defend us now. And as she encouraged him in his sufferings when he was growing white hot, may she encourage us now as we suffer. If there ever was someone who bore the light of Christ, it is she. So she will teach us to do the same now in our own circumstances as we need her help. And with her help in due time, we will come to that temple of God, where we will see the living God face to face and serve him day and night, together with Simeon and Anna, in the world to come, in the new Jerusalem.